there are many professions where we use uh, kind of this unique combination of our brain power, our manual skills, and the tools to solve different problems or, you know, create <coughs> uh, awesome things. And this is kind of a recurring thing across different professions. You might have cooks that will have kind of keep their knives in shape, uh, artists using tools to hide their like, expression, or doctors using tools uh, to make our life better. And as developers, we are not different. We are also using our brains, uh, hardware and software, to develop new things. And when you think about the tools that you are using, those are not fixed in time. We probably start with something very basic, like things off the shelf. But as the time goes by, we learn new things. We add new tools to our toolbox, or we learn how to use existing tools in a better way. So as Adam mentioned, I had this enormous privilege uh, to work with the Angular team for the last four years. Uh, and I learned a lot uh, by doing so. So this talk is like the story of my personal toolbox, like what I had as my, in my tool set before starting this work, what I added, and what tools I refined in the process of the contributing to the framework. So it all started around four years ago, and when I had this opportunity to uh, jump into the development of the Angular, uh, I was like really excited about this because you know those were the superheroes creating this super popular framework. Uh, they were like extremely productive, doing those all the amazing things. So my thinking at the time is was that they need to have access to something very special. They need to have either special tools or have access to the secret information. Uh, or you know, have some kind of brain training techniques or chemicals, I don't know. They have to have access to something which I don't have access to. So my thinking was like, you know, if I hang out with them, if I'm kind of you know, friends with them, maybe I will know some of those secrets and it will make me a better developer as well. So the first thing I noticed that all those people were using Macs. Well, as the Windows developer, I bought a Mac. This must be making me a better developer, right? Well, it didn't quite work. So then I realized that I really didn't know my basics, like, you know, like merges and the open source, like multiple branches. I don't know. I had to learn this stuff. And I know the ecosystem, mobile tools that I care to admit, all the languages that they're using, testing tools, hipster tools, and even, and even technology that I didn't want to learn in the first place. So at this time, I was feeling like I'm growing as the developer. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, my toolbox is getting larger. I'm more capable. But still, when I was sitting in the meetings with the Angular team, I felt like it's not this. It's not the thing that makes me tick. So at this time, I started to notice some subtleties. And one of the first striking things for me is that how the communication is going on inside the Angular team and how it was different as compared to what I was used to at, in the IT industry at large. So the first thing that was really positively surprising is that a lot of discussion inside the team are really data-based or you know, almost scientific, have scientific basis. Uh, so usually when you work on a new feature or like, you know, fixing a hard problem, you start by gathering data. Like, what do I know about the problem? And it's a really good start because it avoids all those kind of deadlock meetings where there's one party saying, like, you know, I think this, and, and the other person will say, like, oh, no, but I feel that. Uh, and you have this exchange, like, you know, I, I think this, I feel that, and blah, 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 and we can go forever, and so on. So as soon as you've got this, you know, scientific data, or, like, you know, in quotes, but, like, as soon as you've got data, the whole discussion is, like, what are we going to do with the facts that we know? And of course, sometimes, you know, you've got arguments like this. You can go back and forth. But there's always someone that kind of steps in and say, like, guys, we are losing time here. We are not being productive. Let's go back. Let's get to learn some more about the problem. The other thing that you probably noticed yourself is that communi communication is extremely open. So the manifestation of this is like uh, weekly team meeting notes where you can access, you can kind of peek into what's going inside the Angular team. But for me, as the external contributor, 
it was extremely uh, surprising at first how open those people are and how inviting they were. Uh, and as external contributors, we really participate to the weekly meetings, to the stand-ups. Mm. We've been visiting Mountain View and had Google folks come over to, to the office where I work. And, you know, it, at this moment, my, the whole premise of, like, there needs to be something secret, they need to have something special, was kind of falling apart because all of a sudden I realized that all the information is there. And I think this trend is kind of accelerating because you can see that uh, many specifications are done in the open. I think the promise specification was kind of beginning of this. Now TC39 meetings are like done in uh, all the nodes are public and so on and so forth. So there is nothing really secret or special. Uh, we are using the same tools that all of like developers are using. We've got access to the same information. It's more like how you communicate or how you convey this information that matters. Now, <coughs> this communication based on facts and openness is very important, but still I felt like there is something different. Like every time I was sitting on the team meetings, I was saying like, those guys must be knowing something I don't know. And at one point, I realized that I was neglecting my most important tool for way too long. And when you think about it, what's the most important tool in our toolbox is this thing. It's gray matter. Normally, it should be gray matter, right? It's kind of bluish here. Um, but it's kind of, at one point, it started really downing on me. It's like, how on earth we can spend months talking about the, which language, which programming language is the best, or we can spend hours fiddling with the settings in our editor, yet we don't know enough about how this thing works and how we can use it the best uh, as the software developers. So the breakthrough moment for me was this book by uh, Daniel Kahneman, which, by the way, was born here in Tel Aviv. And he did quite extraordinary thing because he won as the psychologist a Nobel Prize. And it's quite difficult because there is no Nobel Prize in psychology. So he won one in economics. Um, so this book goes into great details of like how this thing here works and how it doesn't work sometimes. Uh, and it was done in the context of economics, but many of those things are really applicable to our work as developers. So obviously we don't have time to go on to, into like all the details of the, let's say, modern brain science, but I just want to highlight a few things just to get you interested in, in, in those topics. Uh, so the premise of this book that there are like, we can model the function kind of brain into a roughly different system, one more or less intuitive. And if you see this equation, uh, you know the answer immediately, right? Like you don't have to count, you just, just, just ticks. So this is so-called system one at work. And it has some really great properties. It fits very fast. It feels like almost effortless. It gives you the answer, no doubt, two times two, four, great. Unfortunately, it has also some properties which are not great for us of the software developers because the system can give you those answers very fast only because those answers like are either uh, the result of our brain evolution or uh, our past knowledge. So the system is great at doing things like face recognition or emotion recognition when you look at the faces of other people. And it can be quite useful in programming as well. I think many of you had this situation where you look at the bug report like, you know, some obscure description, I don't know what's going on. And all of a sudden, you kind of knew immediately what the problem is, where to go and where to fix the problem. But this part of the brain is not great with data, with actually logical thinking. So to have a feel of the different system, look at this equation and compare the feeling of calculating this to calculating 2.2, right? So it's kind of immediately different feeling. Like, I don't know. Just like, don't get me there. Like, oh. right. And this is this is why, like our, let's say, rational thinking is so hard because we are using different parts of the brain for this. 
Uh, and the system is very important because it does fact checks on this our intuitive past, but it's also good at working with data, working with facts. And this is what we should be doing, or we're doing this a lot when programming. Unfortunately, this part of the brain is not great either because it's slow as compared to system one, and it takes a lot of energy. Now, why it's important? When you think about your mobile phone, it has one battery that powers different systems. It powers the Wi-Fi, the screen, the touchpad, and so on and so on. So we've got this limited amount of energy every day in our brain to do creative work. Now, obviously the first thing we can do badly is to start with the battery that is already drained. So the equivalent of this is not having enough sleep. But there was more interesting piece of research that was really surprising for me, and like I was like, oh man, I was doing this wrong all the time. Actually, it turns out that the same energy that you've got to solve creative problems is also drained, but all the self-control. Let's say someone makes you angry and you are trying not to shout back at him, you need to exercise willpower or self-control. You are draining the same battery. You are on diet, you see delicious cake. You are exercising the same part of the brain. There was very interesting research where two groups of people were given a mathematical problem to solve. One group of people had a like, delicious cake in front of them, uh, and the other had like, some other delicious snacks. But one group was said, like, you can eat whatever you want, like just take all the cookies you want. But the other part of the group was said, like you are not, you are forbidden to, uh, to eat from this jar of cookies. Guess what? The group that was forbidden to take the cookies from the jar was actually performing worst on the mathematical problem just because they had to exercise the willpower. And obviously we know what are other energy traders, right? Like you go to the meeting you're not supposed to be in, you have to fill in some, I don't know, tax forms, uh, which are very exciting uh, thing to do. So why it's important? Like, because it, this is our tool. This is our most important tool. And we need to know how it works. We need to know which energy it needs, when it's good, like which tasks, which, which, which task we should be tackling, which, which parts of the brain. And there is obviously more research. Of, like, it's, you probably know that stress is terrible for like creative. Uh, Thing. And you probably have heard that uh, physical exercise is good for cognitive ability. Uh, there was a, another interesting piece of the research where, once again, two groups of people with a mathematical task uh, were set out to go for a walk. One group went in a forest, another group in a city. And guess what? The group that was working in a city was performing worse as compared to the group that was working in a forest. Once again, those are anecdotes. And like, there are many, many like, other pieces of research. So I'm not saying that you should stop dieting or like, walk in a forest or, and, and so on. I'm just trying to say that there is like, this large body of the brain research going on, which actually tries to explain how our most important tool works. And I think as developers, we are really neglecting it. Now. There is another category of tools, uh, which I call sharp tools. And in many professions, you know, like the sharp tools are essentials. Like you need to use a knife in a kitchen and so on and so forth. So when those tools are used properly, they are excellent. But the problem is that if you are not careful with them, you might hurt yourself or hurt others. So we've got the equivalence of those sharp tools in programming. Uh, one such sharp tool would be, say, impatience or frustration. And, and this impatience or frustration can be a great uh, motivator. Like, you know, you, you are so pissed with something that you decide to do something about it. Say, so like, oh, I'm so angry with Angular that I'm going to make it better, right? Like, great again. But frustration can be also devastating when shared with the others. So here's just an example when I was preparing this talk. This happened on a GitHub. Uh, it's not about like shaming others, but just to like see mechanisms that I play. So if you know this person, Dmitri, he's actually 
very active member of the Angular community and was helping others for uh, months and months and months. And he was trying to help someone on the issue. It unfortunately happened that the person uh, that was asking for help was actually fr super frustrated at this point. And you know, I was coming because like, oh, I just pay wasted the one uh, paid hour, which by the way, it was paid, so we didn't waste it. Uh, but like when, when you, you know, kind of cross check it with the, the, the person who was kind of helping others <coughs> for months for free, and you've got someone coming with one hour, it's like, you know, what, what's wrong? And then you've got called people like, oh, it's all junk. It's like, you know, Angular is like, you know, just, you know, like put it in the trash. And guess what happened with this issue? Dimitri stopped helping this person, like immediately, right? So, like, we, we've got these frustrations. We are all humans and we've got all those emotions. But just, you know, before kind of sharing with this other, just think about like what effect you want to achieve. Because the only effect that was achieved here was that the person didn't get help, right? Maybe he felt better by sharing frustration. I don't know. So there are other things like, you know, people coming every two days and like, do you have any news on the issue? Just please use the, you know, like reaction button or whatever. So once again, I'm not showing those examples to say that they are bad and so on. I'm just showing those examples to say that when you talk on GitHub, you are talking with real people uh, which uses their brain uh, in a certain way, and those things are trigger certain reactions in them, right? And, and, and this is important because I start to see those type of tweets as the recurring them. Like, you know, people are really invested in open source, and after the while saying, like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of burned out. And the striking example of this for me was the, the talk that Igor did uh, in 2015. And it was quite a shock for me because, first of all, he was like a superhero working on Angular. And superheroes are not getting burned out, right? Like, they are superheroes. They are not supposed to get burned out. But he was like talking about, you know, all those things that are happening on open source and the effects it has on, on the person. So once again, you can do great things, but you've also got power that you need to use uh, carefully. Now, the another example of those sharp tools are all the articles that we see comparing one technology to the other. Uh, there, there are multiple articles you can find, like, you know, Angular versus React, or Webpack versus Browserify, or, like, you know, take, pick two examples, you will probably uh, find an article comparing the two. Now, those articles are important because it kind of, you know, can underline the, the strengths and weaknesses of different technologies. But the way we frame those comparisons are really important. Because like, you know, just stabbing at something and say like, oh, this is all crap, or like, oh, you know, this is all junk, it's very easy to do. What is hard to do really is to look at different technologies and say like, oh, this is the great idea, I should borrow it. Or those things were great in other ecosystem, how I can bring it to another ecosystem. So I'm really happy that like, you know, as long as we, like, we've got those kind of bad comparison articles, but at the same time, I'm really happy to see that the leaders of the, uh, of the open source are like, kind of stepping in and saying, you know, like, let's, let's try to frame it a bit uh, more positively. And, and once again, like, there is another positive example from Dominic. He, you probably know him from his work on the, in the Chrome team on, on promise specification. So, like, you know, it kind of doesn't hurt to take this more positive stance and, like, what's actually good in another community and what I can bring to my community. So, this is more or less what happened to me. I was starting my journey with the Angular development, assuming that I will, you know, know secret tools or have access to the secret documentation or that those people like, know more about the technology. And of course, I learned a lot in the process about the technology, the JavaScript, the language, the tools, and blah, blah, blah. But the most important lesson for me was like, really that the way I communicate my ideas matter. Uh, and even more powerfully, there is this thing here, which is my most important tool. And I should be spending uh, at least the same amount of time 
uh, learning about this brain here as compared to writing Webpack or you know, some other tool. So here's my call to action. Next time you think of buying a technical book, think also of reading some brain science book, because it might be actually something uh, that will be the, the most important investment in your skill set. So this is what I added to my toolbox. It's the brain science, it's the communication, and a bit of JavaScript. And think about what you are adding to your toolbox. Thank you.